good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Alberto Rossi, a finance professor at McDonald's School of Business and the director of the AI Analytics and Future Work Initiative. It is a great pleasure to have you here. Um, over the past decade, we've seen an exponential acceleration in the use of new analytics and AI tools in the economy and the workplace. The application of these tools is changing how firms operate, how markets operate, the skills needed to be successful, and how wealth is distributed across individuals in society. And these are the issues that we study in the um, AI analytics and future work initiative. I'm extremely excited today is, uh, about today's event because we have uh, Larry Lerner and Bryce Hall from Quantum Black McKinsey talk to us about how AI analytics are changing the world of consulting. Uh, before leaving the floor to our guests, Larry and Bryce and our moderator, Nick Lovegrove, let me say a couple of words uh, about them. Uh, Larry is a partner at Quantum Black McKinsey uh, where he advises financial institutions on advanced analytics, data transformations, and scaling of digital and analytics capabilities. Before joining McKinsey, he was uh, with Accenture, Capital One, and Citadel. Uh, Larry has an undergraduate degree from WashU and an MBA from the University of Chicago. Larry, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, we then have Bryce. Bryce is an associate partner at Quantum Black McKinsey, where he advises organizations on digital uh, and analytics transformation and leads the development of McKinsey's proprietary digital and analytics assessment tools. Uh, Bryce has an undergraduate degree from Cornell and MBA from Yale. Thank you so much, Bryce, for being with us. Um, and our moderator today is Nick Lovegrove. Uh, Nick is an author, educator, coach, and strategic advisor to businesses, governments, and nonprofits. He is a professor of the practice at Georgetown. Before Georgetown, Nick was a senior and managing partner at McKinsey. Uh, Nick has master's degrees from pretty much everywhere. So in Seyad, Oxford, and Harvard. Um, uh, in terms of housekeeping, we go until 1 p.m. Uh, for those in the audience, please feel free to ask questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom. And without further ado, let me leave the floor to Nick, Larry, and Bryce. Uh, everyone enjoy the event. It's going to be fantastic. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, to welcome my friends uh, Larry and Bryce uh, to Georgetown and to uh, this uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to start, uh, Larry, with you. Uh, uh, Alberto's uh, given you the, the introduction, so I'll dive straight into the questions that we want to cover today, which are really about what are the implications of AI and analytics for the future of consulting? This is something you've been playing a primary, a pioneering role in for quite a long time, not just at McKinsey, but before that at Accenture. And uh, in particular, in the development of Quantum Black as a part of McKinsey. And I think Quantum Black is a very interesting story about how um, this has happened. So I, I wonder if we could start by you telling a little bit about the story of Quantum Black and how, how it's developed within, uh, within McKinsey. Sure. Um, and and thank you for the invite, uh, great to be here. So Quantum Black started as a, as a sports uh, focused startup in the UK, um, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, um, where they were developing models uh, around Formula One races. Um, they would gather all the data from all the different sensors that the cars were, you know, were generating and they would provide real time support to the actual teams. Uh, clearly to be able to do that, they had to develop some very deep capabilities on uh, real time analytics, machine learning uh, and so forth. And so around, you know, and, and there were about a 30 to 40 person shop um, about 2015 or 16 or so, we, uh, McKinsey began to work with Quantum Black, you know, as the firm began to really um, get a lot deeper into topics of digital and analytics. And um, we acquired them soon after. And since the acquisition, Quantum Black has, has really become uh, the control center of everything analytics at McKinsey. Um, today, there's roughly 2,000 people globally within Quantum Black with skills ranging from data science, machine learning, data engineering, solution architecture, design. Um, and and this, is the, um, this is the group that we go to uh, when we are working with clients to really develop um, AI-enabled solutions, machine learning, analytics, 
uh, and, and it's a group that now transcends sort of all geographies and all industries. And it's a fantastic addition to, um, to the firm. Yeah, no, that's, that's super. But it, it seems to me that there are two particular avenues that we might want to discuss. And, and of course, I'll be looking at the Q&A uh, box as well to pick up any questions from uh, those who are joining us. Um, one avenue is the nature of the client work that you're doing and that your colleagues and yourself are doing. And the second is how you do it, is sort of the what and the how. Yeah. And I imagine AI and analytics, indeed, I know they have implications for both. So I wonder if we could start, first of all, by talking about the kind of work, uh, the what, if you like, the kinds of work that uh, that you do, that McKinsey does, that, that Quantum Black does within McKinsey. Can you give some sort of a broad sense of, uh, you've already described a little bit about this, but yeah. uh, some more um, uh, depth on the kinds of work that uh, that, that fit, in, fit into this umbrella. Sure, um, Nick, thanks for the question. Um, I would say that there's three very broad buckets, you know, buckets of work that we would do for our clients. Um, the first bucket, you know, if you imagine the prototypical legacy company that is trying to figure out how do we, ex you know, how do we best apply all of these new tools and techniques uh, to improve our, our business, you know, so call it an, an unsophisticated user of data and analytics, trying to become more sophisticated. Um, and for those clients, the typical type of work that we do is more strategic in nature to to get their um, their journey started. You know, there's a lot of you know operating model and strategic questions that have to be addressed uh, at the onset before they can even start thinking about the kind of advanced analytics that they could be doing. And so this is more of a launching pad type of program. Um, the second type of work that we do, you know, with clients of all sort of sizes and across the full continuum from sophisticated to unsophisticated um, is they're looking for specific solutions to specific problems or challenges that they're having. So, you know, a bank might be having some issues with fraud, you know, a consumer goods company may, may be having issues with the way that they're segmenting customers based on, on their buyer values. Uh, uh, an oil and gas company might be looking for new ways to uh, explore and they want to apply very specific science tools to address those questions. So we might, you know, we might have studies that are focused on very specific questions where the, where the work is largely technical, where we would deploy more analytics, more engineering towards it. Uh, and, and then maybe the, the third broad category um, are the clients that come to us and say, listen, we've been on this journey for a few years now. We've, we've hired engineers, we've hired scientists, we've got the right use cases that we want to go and explore, but we just can't seem to scale. We just can't seem to get from, you know, from a sandbox environment to something that's actually hardened into production. And so there's a lot of questions, particularly today, that we're getting on the topic of scaling. You know, putting putting AI models into production is pretty hard. Uh, and so if you were used to in the past to just putting in, you know, typical logistic re regression models and scoring engines, and now you're trying to develop AI or machine learning models, the the way you get those into production to actually deliver the impact that you're get you, that you're trying to get um, is pretty hard, and so we get a lot of scaling questions. How do you scale the the organization? How do you scale the capabilities? How do you scale our ability to be able to deliver you know ongoing uh, and sustainable results in the long term? Does that That's, make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So those three categories, I think that helps us a lot. And actually, I'd love to turn to Bryce at this point and ask him Bryce ask you um building on the on, on the framework that Larry's laid out can you give us an, an example or two or a sort of an observation about the nature of the kind of work that that you for instance get involved in that, of that fits into the framework that Larry's described yeah absolutely I mean the what what's been so exciting about this work is that across the different companies we work with 
the types of impact that's really material to companies' bottom lines, whether it's through revenue growth or whether it's through cost takeout or improving customer experience, it's it's transformative and it's it's interesting the way that it maps to an individual company's value chain. It looks very different for a mining company than it does for uh, you know an insurance company or for a bank or for an airline. Um, so I can think of any number of examples. One of the ones that that is particularly interesting that that we worked on that that's been public is with Freeport McMoran, um, using AI as a central recommendation engine across all of the set points of a very complex mining operation that was a top performing mining operation for decades. But what they um, what they learned and through this process of mapping an AI engine was that an AI solution could take inputs from IoT sensors across all of the inputs across this mining operation and in the end enable the throughput and the yield of this mine to increase by 15%, which is remarkable because it offsets hundreds of millions of dollars of capital investment needed to build you know, a new, a new plant. And in a sense, one of the things that I sort of like about that in a copper mine, you can think of there are lots of different types of impact, but in a mining operation, it is like really close to actually, you know, <laughs> um, you know, pr printing um, sort of yield at the end of the outcome, right? So um, let me explore a, a further dimension of this. Um, so I think we can all see and appreciate how analytics, advanced analytics, have been playing an increasing role in the business world. The availability of big data, the tools to turn that data into insights. Um, that's been a feature of the landscape for a while now. Um, and in a sense, it is rooted in what consulting firms do, which is um, uh, uh, try to understand what's going on and what to do about it. Um, artificial intelligence is a, it's a related but a different phenomenon. And of course, very much a current obsession of many of us as we've seen the development of generative AI and, and of chat GPT and now BARD and so forth. Um, and I'm wondering how you, how what distinction you've seen, Larry, in the nature of the work that you're being asked to do as a, as a reflection of that transition from the sort of traditional world of analysis, if you like, to the, uh, the new phenomenon of artificial intelligence. <clears throat> I think that the, the fundamental questions, I don't think have changed drastically. Um, you know, I, I live and breathe, you know, uh, sort of banking and insurance air, you know, all the time that that's, that's where I spend most of my time. And, and if I look, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, or today, the nature of the questions are generally focused on, you know, how do we, you know, better enable frontline, you know, marketing and sales, for example, how do we vastly improve our effectiveness and ability to acquire and retain customers? I mean, that's, you know, that's an age old question that we continue to be asked. Um, how do we improve the throughput of our operations? You know, where, where, where can we apply automation, for example? Um, and then, and then I think more importantly, how do we deal with the very complex legal and compliance environment that that that's that surrounds all companies, particularly banks and insurers? And so, with the advent of of AI in the mainstream, you know, the the difference between 50 years ago and today, because let's just be honest, AI has been around for many decades. It, it wasn't invented with ChatGPT or or, or, or any of the other recent developments. But the real, the real sort of shift is that today it's accessible to all companies. The, 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 the playing field has been in, ma in many cases le leveled because we've got massive computing power at our fingertips, massive storage power at our fingertips so that we can actually take, you know, the the academic models that we would have developed 20, 30 years ago and actually apply them in real time to today's environment. So, they, so while the nature of the questions haven't changed all that much, the interest 
Um, and because of the availability of the tools through either open source um, or firms like Quantum Black has made it very achievable for most of our clients. And so we get a lot more questions today because um, either peers um, or, or other industry leaders are sort of paving the way. And then, and then the good news is for most of those situations, we can leapfrog so many of the previous iterations of, of analytics you know, and data pipelines that we would have thought about and go straight to the bleeding edge um, because whether you're a big company or you're a small company, there's, there's no real barriers for you to be able to adopt those techniques. Um, it's a matter of internal processes, culture, access to talent that will typically differentiate those that can do it at scales and, and, and those that can't. Let me, let me describe what I could imagine might be a, a McKinsey project in this arena in your neck of the woods in banking and uh, financial services. So um, lending decisions um, are an analytical decisions, if you like, they're decisions about credit worthiness. Um, historically, those decisions have been made by human beings based upon whatever insights they might have, increasingly upon quite sophisticated analysis, credit scoring, et cetera. Now, I would imagine those decisions could be, maybe should be taken by machines because they would make, quote unquote, better decisions. Is that an accurate reflection of what you're dealing with? Is that the kind of work that you're finding yourself drawn into? And if so, what are some of the considerations that you're having to draw upon in advising clients how far to go in, if you like, handing over key decision-making tasks to the computer? Yeah, um, I, I would represent it slightly differently, Nick. Um, Machine-based decision-making, you know, in credit has been around, you know, for a few decades. I think, um, and, and, and unless you're dealing with very sort of esoteric products, um, you would find that most institutions have adopted, you know, fairly standard credit uh, scoring methods that that tend to rely largely on machines versus humans. Um, obviously, with complex mortgages, complex you know commercial products, you would require a lot more human intervention. I think that the real difference um, is not just in the use of computer to automate decision making but in how those computers are now making those decisions. And there's sort of a positive end of the story and then there's a watch out part of the story. The positive end of the story um, is several fold. Um, number one, you know, five to 10 years ago, I would have built a model based on a sampling of the data that's available, right? So uh, whereas today, I would just simply use all the data, mm -hmm. right? So. One of the major benefits of having access to quote unquote unlimited computing power and storage is that you're no longer limited in what data you can actually look at to make decisions. And that can become quite, you know, it could become quite overwhelming, but you get rid of a lot of the bias sort of errors that you would have gotten because of, of sampling methodologies, you know? So that's, that's one major difference. The second major difference is that Today, you can use a wider variety of data, right? So just to take a, an example, if I'm, if I'm trying to underwrite, you know, somebody that doesn't have a long credit history, you know, maybe he's a, you know, she's a new graduate from college, maybe she's a new immigrant, then we can start to bring in other sort of nonlinear data to make those decisions. We can look at behaviors, we can look at you know, at other data points that maybe five to 10 years ago, we would have not been able to look at. And, and, and we can start to, you know, to, to develop, you know, more nuanced decisions based on that data. The flip side of all of that, right? And, and, and this is a huge topic, not only in banking, but in all industries. So you gotta be really careful, right? Because once you build a machine learning model that is teaching itself how to optimize decisions, you don't quite know where potential bias may come into the model, right? So 
you know, while you may not be overtly underwriting, you know, based on sex, gender, you know, sexual orientation, to name a few, it is possible that the model will be looking at data that could naturally cluster potential applications based on those criteria without you knowing it. And so there's a, there's a bigger effort today to ensure that not, not only the models that you're building sort of are ethically sound, but that they're eliminating you know, any potential bias that would not be allowable by, by the many regulations that, that, um, that govern you know, banking and insurance. And so while we're all very excited about the opportunities that new technologies and techniques are, are bringing to us, you know, there, there's a lot more work to be done in just ensuring that we keep that high bar on, you know, fairness of lending, fairness of, of, of analysis and so forth. So I'm glad you brought up that issue of bias and prejudice um, and, and the risk that that's embedded in, in, the, in the models, um, because I'm sure that's going to be a theme and I, uh, already is in some of the questions that are being asked uh, of us. Um, and it sort of uh, raises the question that I think uh, underpins a lot of our anxiety, if you like, about all this, which is what is the role for human beings? Um, what are the roles for human beings? And I've heard you talk, and, and let's address that question specifically in the context of your clients, in the context of organ the organizations you serve. One of the uh, terms I've heard you use in talking about this is translators, is uh, that, that actually what a lot of people in client organizations need to be able to do is to translate what's emerging from the uh, machines and the tools into um, if effective uh, uh, capabilities within the organization. Can you talk a little bit more about that translation function and actually just more broadly about how this is um, influencing organizational structures and approaches? Yeah. Um... I'm going to answer the question by just starting with a very broad comment that I get asked a lot by students um, and, and, and clients, you know, am I afraid that all of our jobs are going to be eventually eliminated by all this automation? And, and, and my answer is always like a resounding no. You know, um, analytics, AI, ML, these are all enablers that in, in, enable us to do our, our jobs better and faster but they don't replace most of the jobs that we know today. There, I mean, some will be replaced, but others will be created. Um, and what we've seen is the emergence of a number of new roles that, that corporations are adding to their structure that are very, very exciting. You know, if, if I were graduating from college or from my master's degree, you know, like next week, um, I would definitely be, you know, gravitating towards this translator role because it is it is what aligns best with my own sort of uh, educational DNA. What a what a translator is, and by the way, I hate the term, but if anybody has a better one, then please let me know. Um, it is what I call the connective tissue. They the the connective tissue between the business and between the technology and, and analytic teams. Um, oftentimes, you know, we tell our, our clients, whatever you do, make, make sure that you're always taking a value first approach. You know, don't go off building shiny objects for the sake of building a, sh a shiny object. Make sure that everything that you're working on is deeply steeped in the value that that widget or capability is going to create. And so if you imagine just a, a, a simplistic definition of a, of a company, you've got a, you've got a, a business line, a product or a service that is facing the market and gathering market needs, yeah, customer requirements, product re requirements. And those needs have to then be translated into actual solutions, right? So in the example that Nick gave earlier, um, there, you know, there may be a new way that we could underwrite credit for a specific segment of the population. And those requirements have to be communicated in a way that the technical teams uh, can digest them, can work on them, and then can deliver something that can actually track to those requirements. Uh, and then vice versa, once, once the capabilities are out in the market, we have to track to make sure that it's delivering the actual results that we would have hoped 
that they deliver. Typically speaking, technical teams um, are not the best at playing that connective tissue role, at playing the role that, um, that, that connects the dots between what business needs um, and, what you know, and what's required by technology to deliver that. And so we've seen the emergence of this role that we call translator, which basically sits in between those two teams. Um, it, is a, it, it is a role that, that wears a business first hat. In other words, um, it's a role that typically sits with the business and understands um, the strategic direction of the business. But then it's a role that, that's very deeply steeped in, in analytics and technology, and it's able to then transfer those requirements into actionable products or capabilities that can then can be built by the technology and the data teams. So, and, and that makes perfect sense to me, and I can easily see how that is a role that human beings can play. But I almost also wonder if it isn't a role that ChatGPT can play, that um, uh, generative AI can play. Um, uh, as, you, as you know, I... Um, because uh, I sent you the answer the answers that I I went in I went on chat GPT yesterday and asked a bunch of the questions that I was going to ask you um, about today's uh, webinar during today's webinar and I got and I sent you the answer you know extremely thoughtful uh, sensible lists of questions and observations um, uh, in about fifteen minutes. Um, and I, as with so many of these things, I don't know whether to be delighted or Terrible. You were very nearly made redundant. I was pretty much near. I I think nearly is probably. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure it was nearly. I think I was made redundant. Um, so I guess that begs the question. You know, uh, I think it's implicit in in Bryson what you say. Maybe you could you could address this first. Is uh, what is the risk of redundancy for people that we have been thinking about as these are the people who are the connective tissue, the translators, yeah. people who can take the data science and turn it into regular language. Well, ChatGPT can do that pretty well. Yeah, to, to, to build on what Larry was saying, the sort of core translator role in a lot of what we see in organizations is the need to raise the business acumen of the technologists. So the people who are data scientists and, and um, ML coders, to make sure that they have deep understanding of the business needs. And on the business side, a broad effort to just raise the technical acumen and understanding of these different models and technical capabilities. But all of that is in design, identifying opportunity, designing solutions. The outcome of that very much ties, I think, to, to, to what you're getting at now, which is sometimes we refer to it as hybrid intelligence. So to go back to the mining example, there, there was a lot of worry at that site that this AI engine would replace a set of people who had decades of deep expertise in ore types in mining and how these crushers and chemical you know, operations work, what we ended up finding was that all of them were needed to make this AI solution really successful. And so now in addition to having that deep expertise that they, they have gleaned from their 20 years of work experience, all of that is inputs into um, designing the AI model in operating the whole AI engine, which requires hundreds of sensors that need to be calibrated and implemented, um, in addition to all of the data scientists and AI modelers. And so the, if you think about that whole solution, which optimizes the, the economic value of that site, it depends on the hybrid intelligence of really deep legacy traditional expertise in all kinds of areas. And um, AI roles and, and, and models too. So we find that in a lot of situations that AI solutions, technology solutions are dazzling and exciting and, and um, but that what really unlocks value in many, if not most situations is that the hybrid intelligence of real people working with the technology solution, driving decision-making, whether it's using that insight to, you know, to price a, a, a sort of a financial offering or so forth. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, it's a very helpful clarification. It sort of speaks to what Thomas Malone has called superminds or the, the the human machine collaboration and how that works. But let's let's take that as a as a segue into talking about 
the impact on the way in which consulting work is done, which is the second part of this. So there was the what do, do consultants do and yeah. then the how do they do it? And, you know, I'll, I'll play, I don't know if it's devil's advocate or uh, I'll articulate something I don't necessarily believe, but there is a point of view that would say one of the professions that is most vulnerable, quote unquote, to um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is consulting. Um, because after all, consulting is a uh, an activity that's all about the development of wisdom and insight um, and, the, and the translation of that into action uh, uh, with clients. And a lot of that can now be done by machines. I spent most of my career at McKinsey, I spent a lot of that time trying to find data, uh, trying to do the kind of sampling that uh, Larry was talking about earlier, trying to figure out the so what's of it and translate. Now, much of that, much of what I spent my, my career doing can be done in hours, minutes, seconds, um, uh, rather than in the days, weeks, months that it used to take me. Um, so as a, as a simple matter of logic, it would tend to suggest that we need fewer rather than more human beings to be consultants. Larry, I, I know you take a different view of that. What, how do you see the uh, the implications of this for human beings as consultants? Um, so I'll 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 use the framing that I'm I'm answering the question, assuming that there are folks in the room that are looking into consulting and and may want to make decisions in a for or against. Um, so I would say a few things. Nick, uh, and, and, and that is a terrific questions that even my oldest daughter, who's a sophomore in college has asked me a few times, like, am I, am I about to get replaced by a computer? Um, I think it all depends what type of work you are doing. Um, if the nature of the work that you're doing is uh, largely research-based, repetitive, sort of data-driven in nature, um, I do think that a lot of those roles over time are going to be diminished, right? Um, I don't know if if anybody read the recent news about what Morgan Stanley has done with open AI, but they have basically taken the intelligence of, I don't know the number, 100, 150,000 research reports. You know, they've sort of pointed the large language model, you know, sort of engines against those research reports. And they are beginning to generate insights that, uh, you know, brokers or relationship managers can then give their clients, you know? And so arguably, if your job um, at a Morgan Stanley, for example, was to do that work, um, yeah, I think, I think some of those roles are going to be uh, diminished over time but they're gonna be replaced by, by other roles. You know, uh, open AI and large language models in and of themselves, you know, um, are sort of a blunt instrument that, you know, that has to be shaped and has to be fine-tuned to address very, very specific questions. Um, and, and, and those questions are, are still gonna be driven by, by individuals charting the course um, of a company. So when you look at a firm like ours and so, and so many others, you know, that are providing advice to top management, top leadership um, on how to traverse, you know, the very, very choppy waters, whether, you know, because of economy, because of uh, emerging technologies, uh, those roles are, you know, that, that, that human um, input um, is still very much front and center, you know, in every situation. Um, what AI and ML are, are doing for us is it's just massively accelerating the rate of production, you know. So I'll give you just three or four examples. You know, um, five years ago, if I had a, a new model to build, I, I would have started from scratch, you know, to build this recommendation engine, for example. Today, I can just start with something that's available, you know, in the world, you know, through open source and use that as an accelerator so that I'm, maybe I'm changing 20% of the parameters. So that vastly accelerates the rate through which you can actually develop new ideas and new innovations. Um, example number two is, you know, I'm, I'm creating a marketing campaign for a new credit card product. 
you know, through the advent of, of AI and generative AI, I can make those campaigns way more personalized. You know, I can, I can actually have a, a running start in, in how I develop different voices and different types of offers um, that it would have taken me some time to do you know, in the past. And, and, and those are just two examples, so I'll stop there. So we very much see it as an accelerator, which, we know, which means that engagements could be potentially shorter um, or engagements could just be measured by different standards. But by and large, I think all of us at the firm would um, are continuing to welcome all these innovations with open arms because it's not only enabling us inside the firm to do things more effectively, it's also enabling our clients, you know, to fly even higher. So we see it as a, as a very positive. No, that's very helpful. And, and by the way, what, what do you think about organizations? Um, I think I read that JP Morgan was trying this and also universities and schools that are quote unquote trying to ban chat GPT or trying to sort of block it or what, what, what do you think? What, what, I, I can kind of imagine your reaction to that, but what do you think when you, when you hear that? I, I will let Bryce also answer. Um, I will answer the question as a father versus as a, as a professional today. Um, you know, I think that with the right boundaries, uh, I think it's, it's ultimately a plus. Um, just like calculators were a plus, you know, 30 years ago and computers were a plus, you know, 15 years ago, um, you, you can't stop innovation and, and, and over time, we're going to continue to generate products and generate things that are going to enable us to get from A to B faster. The fear I have, particularly with chat GPT, is that it's replacing original thought. Mm -hmm. You know, that at the end of the day, uh, if you're using it as a way to generate ideas in the same way that Bryce and I would lock ourselves in a room and a whiteboard and problem solve and, and just sort of, if it's a, if, if, if it's a way of, of accelerating idea creation um, and structuring potential arguments to make sure that you're hitting all the right points, like, I think that's fine because it's no different than, than Googling, you know, 10 years ago or then, you know, using a calculator 30 years ago. But at the point that it begins to replace original thought and at the point that it begins to, to eliminate the human element in, in, in setting context and setting guidelines, that's the, you know, that's the place where I begin to worry and so some of the oversteering that you might be seeing today um, is merely a, a, a fear of the unknown. Mm. And I think we have a long way to go to establish the right boundaries, both in education as well as in, you know, corporate environments. You know, we ourselves are doing a tremendous amount of research um, in this topic, and it continues to evolve, you know, just week by week. I don't know, Bryce. Well, let, let, as you transition to Bryce, let me let me ask a question that Paul Kildes has asked um, in in the in the Q and A. He's asked, "Can you elaborate on how incoming consultants should learn about AI? Is the skill of the future coding, or what are the, what are the skills that a consultant needs in order to be effective?" So, you both did MBA degrees, as did I, but in like not not quite as long ago as me, but quite a while ago. And but if you were um, trying to structure your graduate education or even your undergraduate education today how would you do it what what skills what capabilities would you want to be sure that you were uh, developing in order to be um to hit the ground running if you like in this brave new world Bryce, do you want to have a first crack at that sure. i mean if i if i take a minute to reflect when i started at mckinsey 10 years ago and nick you have a longer view of what the firm was like earlier than that but even when I started at the firm, um, a, a senior advisor shared with me that most of the problems that McKinsey and, and major consulting firms would, would advise clients on, we would bring a team leader and a set of associates or business analysts, and we would work with a, an organization to understand the problem and to come up with a, a, an approach to solve that. Today, the bench of talent and roles that we have for client needs looks incredibly different than that. And so just to start with, you know, having 
four, 500 data engineers, a thousand data scientists. We have project and agile coaches. We have software and cloud engineers, um, 500 designers. And then we have a set of consultants that play an integrative role. So people who are able to quarterback these solutions really to work with the organizational change that's needed to implement the, the transition from a legacy organization or even a, 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 an organization that today is a digital or analytics leader to be able to incorporate generative AI or the, the frontier technologies that will evolve over the next few years. It involves all of those people working together. And so I would say, you know, one of the things to think about for new graduates thinking about consulting, thinking about their next wave of education, um, there are so many opportunities in this new wave of technologies and how they're massively transforming businesses. One of, clearly one of the key success factors is having an, a, a learning mindset and just fully immersing yourself in, um, in these various technologies and keeping pulse of the different types of roles of people that are involved in implementing these new solutions. But it will look different in two years than it looks today. It will look different in five years. And so I think having that you know, continuous learning you know, mindset is, is really essential even there's a, you know. No, I think that's a very, very good way of describing it because you know, you refer to my long history at McKinsey and through much of that long history, we kind of had one way of operating. It was called EM plus two. It was, you know, an engagement manager, a project manager, plus two consultants who would could crack any problem, do anything. Um, but it, not in reality, of course, it was a very limited model. And then, and we knew it was a limited model, but it's kind of all we knew how to do. I, in the intervening years, in particular, the last five or six years, it seems to me that has completely change from what I hear from you and from others and there's much more um, multi-dimensional and frankly much more uh, effective and tailored model um, has developed with this suite of skills and capabilities that are now much broader than previously existed. Larry you've been through this transition yourself and indeed you know you've driven much of it as, as somebody who's worked in analytics for decades you want to add you know, how, how, how this has affected the way in which consulting works, if you like, as a profession? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's only made our life more interesting. Um, I, I mean, I, I absolutely love what I do and, and, and the way that I get to do it today versus, you know, even five years ago uh, is, 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 is way more interesting because we get to see their results um, of our of our efforts so much faster. So I again I I think it's only a net plus. Um, and as I take a step back and think about what would I have done differently, you know, were I an MBA student today, you know, looking to get into the field, and this is a bit related to Bryce's answer just now. I think I would have definitely taken more. Uh, STEM type classes, maybe not to the extreme that I would become a Python coder, but really understanding the crux of, of these solutions. I've, I've got several clients today that are all late into their careers, you know, season managers, you know, call it 50-ish plus, you know, I'm going to just do a very broad swath that have gone back to school and that have gotten AWS certifications and that have gotten a Stanford, you know, diploma on artificial intelligence, you know, and, and when I see my clients that have been proven leaders for 30 years, go back and, and sort of recraft their own internal, you know, toolkit, you know, it tells me that as, as students today, it's something that I, I that that I would not take for granted, particularly if you're going to be thinking about you know either becoming a senior leader one day or a great consultant. Um, these are topics that that I think are required, whether you are a data scientist or or whether you you're not a data scientist. So my in my own personal you know arc, I would have gone back and and just been a lot more disciplined in understanding the, the context of technology data and, and analysis rather than, than expecting others in my team 
to know that really well and sort of cover me for that. By the way, there's a, there's, I agree with that uh, assessment. It, it, there's, an, um, there's a wonderful column just written by um, Ethan Mollick, a professor at Wharton, who you and I have talked about and who I would recommend to everybody, um, uh, entitled Magic for English Majors. And uh, his th one of his theses is that um, ChatGPT and other uh, generative AI technologies create enormous opportunities for people whose kind of... Uh, uh, focuses on language, is on expression, is on idea generation, uh, and how the, and their ability to interact with the technology. So, for those of our listeners who are English majors, this isn't all bad by any means. They, it, but it does require, as you say, some investment of time to understand um, what the technology does, because otherwise you just think of it as a black box and you you have no idea what it's doing and and can't. Do it. Which brings me on to the. Uh, the, the the next topic that I want to explore, maybe one of the last topics, um, which is uh, the ethical considerations um, that relate to this. And uh, you, you referred to it earlier. But, you know, I think we're all of us concerned about the implications for data privacy, for bias, for transparency. You know, we're just seeing uh, in a different kind of realm of the technology world, uh, TikTok being... Uh, berated in on Capitol Hill, um, uh, potentially banned. Um, what to, what are the kinds of questions that clients are asking you that you're having to navigate around the ethics of artificial intelligence? I'll start, and then Bryce, you can uh, you can also weigh in. In my uh, in 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 the circles that I swim in banking and insurance, I would say that 80% of the questions tend to be much more risk and regulatory focused. There's a very, very high level of concern that any of these models that are developed, while they might be incredibly powerful, that are somehow going to get the bank in trouble, right? Or the company in trouble. Uh, and so that leads to longer than expected delays in getting models properly tested to make sure that they not only meet the regulatory and compliance bars, but also the, the bank's own internal bars on, 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 on some of these topics. Um, and so I think that the topic of privacy and bias um, I think it's one that we're just beginning to scratch the surface on, Nick. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's probably the single biggest roadblock that we're going to see you know, in the coming years to actually seeing generative AI and AI in general spread across all types of business challenges. So in topics where you require a virtual agent you know, to provide advice, in topics where you're creating you know, hyper personalized content for marketing campaigns, you know, in topics where you're trying to understand the type of embedded data you might have in legacy systems through AI. I mean, there's, there's, there's many areas where, you know, I think that innovation will continue. But anytime you get into, am I going to make a decision on an individual, you know, that's going to affect an individual, a credit decision, a product placement decision, uh, an approval, a decline decision, whenever the decisions that the models are making are going to affect individuals one way or another, I think that's where you're going to see the most, um, the most hesitation to take all those into production. So if you go, you know, if you look at where companies today are making the most uh, you know, inroads, uh, you, you're gonna be pleased that you know, they are in areas where you know, you're, you're, you're providing access to self-service, you're providing access to better information, you're simplifying operations, you're automating processes. Um, you're not quite yet seeing it in that you're making decisions that affect individuals. And 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 I, and I think for that we still have a ways to go, largely because of of this concern that you know these models may in one way, shape, or form 
not be clearing the bar on, on ethics and compliance. You know, I find myself thinking um, about the observations you made right at the start of this conversation about the development of Quantum Black as a, as a business in the first instance, which was based on sensors in motor cars, in racing cars, and um, the whole role that sensors have in, in the intervening years, the increasing role that they've played in our lives, the Internet of Things, pretty much everything has a sensor in it. I have a sensor on my wrist, um, uh, which is translating data into a, in, in, uh, into um, at least advice, if not decision making about what I do. Um, and yet I wonder, have, have we individually or collectively examined or, or come to a resolution about how much we're willing to just hand over to sensors that are following our every move. It's kind of a both an area of joking, you know, when we get interrupted by our wristwatch in the course of a conversation, but it's equally an area of great concern. Bryce, you, you, I know you do a lot of work in on the yeah. What do you think? Well, I would say that we are simultaneously bullish on the opportunity and excited about the, the kind of value that these technologies create and also clear-eyed about the risks that, that they present. I, I read one analogy that particularly with generative AI and, and how much sort of attention that has gotten recently that it, it feels like we, we have opened Jurassic Park without installing the, the fences yet. Um, as part of our global research, we track these risks, AI related risks, and we have for the past five years, um, to what extent organizations are identifying risks on cybersecurity, on regulatory regulatory compliance, on explainability, um, equity and fairness. And we are still in early days of working through all of the different implications and risks, identifying them and then properly mitigating them. So. Um, one of the things that's been somewhat surprising is that organizations have not significantly moved the needle on most of those risks and actually being able to effectively mitigate them. So it's as, as the frontier is moving and these technologies are evolving and the, the commercial threshold changes for them. So more and more of these AI capabilities are now commercially viable and, and can be used for all kinds of in, innovative applications, which is what's so exciting about it. It also just opens up so many adjacent risks um, you know, in the categories that we just described and organizations and society overall uh, you know, has, has work to do to, to, uh, to, to, to understand and to, to mitigate those. So while you were talking, Joe Biden tried to contact me on my wristwatch. So um, there you <laughs> go. Um, I have two more questions, one of which I'm gonna take from uh, Anne Grotchen, uh, one of our guests who um, asked this question, what is the strategy you use to work with stakeholders who are resistant to analytical insights, who, um, as she puts it, my gut has always led decision-making and served me well. well. How do you, how do you, what kind of conversation do you have with people who are going, well, you know, this is all very well, lots of data, lots of analysis, lots of, a lot of analytical stuff, some of it, you know, incredibly sophisticated, but, you know, ultimately I wanna make my own decisions. I wanna use my own judgment. Um, I, I'm I, I'm I'm not going to rely upon all of this stuff that I don't fully understand. What what do you say in those circumstances? Yeah, that's you know, welcome to my world, and 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 you know, <laughs> so many of my clients uh, historically have 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 sort of been down that journey. Uh, and by the way, I see it all over the world. I don't you know, this is not a, a geographic specific. Um, so there's there's actually a few proven ways that that we tend to address those uh, those topics and and really it all depends what's the context for the meeting what's the context for for the conversation um, so first and foremost um, and thanks to the amazing work that Bryce does we have an unbelievable trove of factual benchmark data that very clearly demonstrates what performance looks like when you're doing this right versus when you're not. So number one, we have been in this journey long enough that we have now been tracking this over, over time. Um, 
And we're beginning to see a further separation, you know, what we call kind of the front runners, the, you know, the companies that, that have adopted, embraced, and, and sort of scale, you know, versus the, the, the rest of the pack. So, so the first thing I try to do is I try to separate sort of the opinions from the actual facts. Uh, and that's, and, and that tends to be a very effective way of just sort of centering and balancing the conversation, um, uh, not, not only on the facts around the art of the possible, but just sort of day in and day out run the business tackling specific you know, problems and issues. Um, so, so the data exists and the data is available. Um, now, once you get inside, you know, so, so that's kind of at the top of the house conversation. Once you start getting into the pockets of adopters and non-adopters within companies, um, you know, I jokingly used the word, you know, you, you know, you embarrass somebody long enough, they will eventually get the point. You know, we tend to start working with the, the products or the business units that are most inspired by this because they are the most willing to put real time and effort um, in, in going the distance. You build a coalition of the willing. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and, what we, and what we tend to find nine out of 10 times is that you get enough momentum in business unit A, you know, let's call it the credit card business, you know, that pretty soon the, the commercial lending and the small business lending and the personal, you know, loans business is going to, you know, it's, it's going to start seeing that, wow, you know, Nick over here is getting some pretty amazing results and they're going to very quickly run and see, you know, what's, what's the secret sauce. So, so, you know, the great, you know, the, the great proof points that you can provide in actual bottom line progress are the, you know, if are the best way to get sort of the rest of the organization to adopt but you will always have those, you yeah. know, those laggards or those, you know, out, outliers that eventually either they end up jumping on the bandwagon or they end up departing for greener pastures because the, the rest of the company has moved too far away from their way of managing and the way of leading. I mean, in that sense, this is just a, the, a, a new manifestation of the age old change resistant versus change responsive kind of dichotomy that uh, exists, has always existed within organizations. And by the way, we haven't talked about it much today, but that's a feature of the academic landscape as, as well. And, and universities uh, and schools right. have the same, exact same issues. So I have one final question and unfortunately we only have about a minute for it. Um, and it's a little slightly provocative question, which is there's been quite a lot of criticism of consultant consulting firms always has been, but especially recently, and quite a bit of it about of McKinsey, um, as you know. And um, McKinsey gets sort of blamed for a lot of things that are wrong or dubious about cons uh, capitalism, um, rightly or wrongly. But I can imagine a book being written in 20 years saying, Oh my goodness, you know, look at the terrible things that artificial intelligence did to human consciousness and they turned us all into zombies and uh, walking zombies and so on. And McKinsey was responsible. McKinsey did this to us. Um, I'm guessing you don't sleep, lose too much sleep at night over that, but I wonder how do you think about this as, you know, this is now your life's work. How do you think about this as a way, uh, you know, what, what, how would you, uh, prepare your defense, if you like, against that potential charge. I mean, Nick, so you've just eliminated a bunch of nights of sleep moving <laughs> forward because I hadn't thought of that 20 year scenario, but I can, I can only imagine that that's, you know, somewhere, you know, in the- I, I ask in part because these, yeah. books, you know, the, the book in question does make me think about things I did 20 years ago yeah. and think, geez, was I on the right side or the wrong side of that? And so, I mean, the, the, the thing that I'll say is, you know, number one, um, everything that we do is, is very much steeped in, you know, what, what, what is the um, sustainable and positive impact that it's going to deliver. And when we define impact, we're not just defining it as a bottom line impact. We're defining it 
and, and we've got a sort of a, a continuum of, um, of features that, that we use when we define you know, inclusive and sustainable impact. Mm -hmm. And so we use that as our barometer all the time. Uh, so to me, that's the first thing is everything that we develop, everything that we advise on is very steeply grounded on, is this going to deliver sustainable and inclusive um, impact, which, which is a panacea for, for a lot of unintended consequences that just having a very myopic view on bottom line results would have. Hey, Larry, I'm going to uh, interrupt yeah. because we're out of time. And, that, and that's a good place to end. Actually, you always end with impact. That's always a good, uh, good, good, good uh, positioning, uh, good, good way of thinking about it. And I know that is uh, something you and your colleagues take very seriously. And I appreciate this very much. It's a fascinating conversation. And uh, uh, I would certainly not want to give you sleepless nights. But I think for a lot of us, this is both incredibly exciting and also a little bit scary. So you've helped us to understand um, how to be, you know, why, what the excitement is and uh, a way of dealing with the, the things that are a bit scary. So thank you very much indeed to Larry and to Bryce. And thank you to everybody who's joined us uh, this afternoon. Have, uh, have everybody has a great weekend. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and good weekend. You too. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. All the rest. Bye bye.